start, welcome to the stage, Christine Stark. We'll introduce tonight's keynote speaker. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. All right. So, I have the privilege and the honor of introducing our keynote speaker for the evening. Um, the Honorable Judge Benjamin T. Reyes, the second. Um, Governor Brown appointed Judge Reyes just this year um, to serve on the Superior Court for the County of Contra Costa. On July 12, 2017, Judge um, Tani Pencil Sapuni administered the oath of office to Judge Reyes. He is the very first Filipino American judge appointed to the county of Contra Costa, where Filipinos are actually the largest minority, um, Asian minority in that county. He is only the second Filipino American judge to serve in the area for the nine counties. Prior to his appointment, he managed a public agency practice and most recently was equity principal at Myers Nave a statewide full-service law firm specializing in the local government agencies. There, he served on the Executive Committee and Diversity Committee. He chaired the firm's statewide public contracts practice. He also served as the city attorney for both the city of Pinol and Union City. He was the very first Filipino-American to serve as a city attorney in the San Francisco Bay Area. Additionally, Judge Reyes has been a key player um, on the F Bank, the Filipino Bar Association of Northern California's board. He's served as the advisory board member there. He's also served on the National Filipino American Lawyers Association, um, most recently served as the chair of the Awards and Endorsements Committee. Judge Reyes is also an Eagle Scout. He served as the Vice President of the Boy Scouts of America and Alameda's um, contingent there. And he previously served as the President of the Alameda Free Library Foundation, as a board member of the California Alumni Law Association at UC Berkeley, go Bears. And also served as a chair of the Contra Costa City Attorneys Association previously. He has also taught on the faculty at USF Law School, USF, go oh, USF, and volunteers for the trial skills program at Sanford Law. And he is also training right now to get his black belt <laughs> at Westland Karate School. A couple things that I just wanted to mention since I have the privilege and honor of knowing Ben, and he's served as one of my amazing mentors. Um, he is such a generous, generous person, not just as a judge, not just as a lawyer, but he gives his heart, he gives his soul, he gives his passion to others. I mean, uh, one of the, I think Contra Costa is very privileged to have him as a judge. Uh, one of his goals, he's told me, is to diversify the bench um, and diversify the quotients in Contra Costa County of attorneys um, and that's one of his goals, and he's even reached out to me to help him get that started. If any of you work in Contra Costa County and want to assist him in this endeavor, I'm sure he'd be happy to take on any help to get um, the diversity numbers up in that county. Uh, and he's just been an amazing mentor. Just last week he asked me, for some details on a couple of the people he's going to be mentoring this year as part of the F, as part of that thing. So he really, really cares about diversity, and I feel very honored and privileged to have him as a mentor and a friend. Um, without further ado, the Honorable Ben Reyes. This 
So uh, thank you to my good friend and fellow F-Bank and Impala member, Christine Stark, for that kind introduction. As many of you may know, uh, Christine recently received the Napaba Best Under 40 Award just two weeks ago in Washington, D.C., so give it up to Christine. So I am very honored and humbled to be here at the 40th Annual Minority Bar Coalition Unity Award Ceremony. This is amazing. 40 years of unity, 40 years of diversity, and 40 years of service. I am so privileged to be in the presence of greatness. I know that all of you have exhibited leadership and accomplished wonderful things for the community in order for your respective bar associations to nominate you for the Unity Awards this evening. So I'm proud to be a witness to your achievements here tonight. Your service to our collective community is admirable, and I share the enthusiasm of everyone in this room for your contributions. Your achievements are the collective achievements of our entire community. So congratulations to all the award recipients this evening. My message to you this evening is simple. Tell your stories. Just recently I've been asked, why do we have minority and diversity bar associations? Is there really a need for them? If we are truly trying to be a colorblind society where we are judged by our professional skill and talent, why have a Charles Houston Bar Association, or Baylor, or ABBA, or La Raza, or FBank? Why can't we just all join the American Bar Association, or the local county bar association, and assimilate? This inquiry was well-intentioned, and it was asked without ill intent, which prompted me to think about this issue very seriously. You know, for me, it's just natural to be a member of FBank and to be a member of ABBA and to serve, and that's just who I am. But this inquiry forced me to articulate the justification for our existence. The purpose of any ethnic, cultural, or minority professional organization is never to exclude anyone or to create a divisive society or to create an exclusive society. Indeed, I presume that all of our bar associations are open to everyone who wish to support their mission. I submit that the purpose of our organizations is not only to preserve cultural, ethnic, or personal identity, but to organize ourselves, to foster unity, and enhance our communities. I further submit that the purpose of an ethnic or minority bar organization is not to further divide us, but to lobby to have our voices heard, to demand a place at the figurative table, and to celebrate our accomplishments, since mainstream society will not do that for us. Most notably, I submit that one of the most important roles for our minority bar associations is to combat discrimination and implied bias against members of the minority communities. As lawyers, bench officers, law professors, members of the minority legal communities, we have a special duty to make our voices heard, to teach others about the history of our communities, our struggles, and to educate each other about the beauty and richness of our heritage. So we've all read history books throughout school and heard about our European forefathers who became Americans, or in Columbus's case, Europeans who discovered America, even though the Native American people were already here. The epic mythology of our American heroes often overshadows the poor treatment of people of color, of women, and the disenfranchised. Indeed, American history has been written in a manner that does not highlight the achievements of its minority population. Sure, we've read about the achievements of Thomas Jefferson, but not about the African slaves that he imprisoned in Monticello. We read about the history of Daniel Boone, but not much is written about his campaign to displace the Native American who would not be tribes, or the revolt that he caused among the Cherokee people. In high school, 
I never read about the plight of Filipino immigrants who worked in the fields in Delano and Stockton and who started the farm labor movements along with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. And thank you to the good work of Assemblymember Rob Bonta of the 18th Assembly District for recognizing the contributions of Larry Ipinong and Philip Veracruz. In 1965, these men organized the farmers and demanded fair wages and organized the Delano Great Boycott and convinced Cesar Chavez to join them. Assemblymember Rob Bonta recently passed legislation that requires our public schools to teach about the history of Filipino migrant farm workers. Their story will be told, but there are many other stories that are not heard. For example, I didn't put into context my own father's struggle as one of the 30,000 Filipino sailors who joined the United States Navy during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. These young men left the Philippines on the promise of great opportunity to live in the United States, to see the world, and to advance in a Navy career of service. They were promised skills, technical training, and citizenship. But instead, all Filipino men who joined the Navy during that time, including my own father, were by a discriminatory policy and practice assigned to work the galleys as mess specialists, and that's the Navy's acronym for a cook, and to work the galleys and to work as stewards, which is the Navy acronym for waiters, to serve the Navy officers. These men were not brought to the United States to stand on equal footing with others. They were brought here as servants. My father, despite his university education, was not provided with the opportunity to learn ship operations, surface warfare, or to develop engineering skills, which is what he was promised. He was assigned as a servant to cook for the rest of the crew. So these stories are not written. Neither were the stories about the 260,000 Filipino World War II veterans and our country's promise of citizenship and modest subsistence benefits. These men and women were called into service by President Franklin Roosevelt when the Philippines was still an American Commonwealth. These Filipino soldiers fought side by side with the Americans during the Pacific Theater. It was not until Major General Tony Tagupa Ben de Guzman, and countless volunteers, including lawyers from our community, spent several years of intense advocacy. Not only did they do that, they did that, excuse me, they spent several years of intense advocacy, and only then did my grandparents' generation receive the recognition that they deserved. 75 years later, they now are recipients of the Congressional Gold Medal. I also did not read in our high school history books about the two million refugees who fled Vietnam by boat during the late 70s to escape the economic hardship and destruction left in the wake of the Vietnam War. These brave people suffered storms, disease, starvation, and pirates and navigated the open waters of the Pacific to find better lives for their families. I also did not read in our high school history books about the contributions of Supervisor Harvey Milk, or how we organized the Teamsters and the Asian and Middle Eastern grocery owners of the Castro District to boycott anti-union beverage distributors with great success. This is among many of his contributions in his fight for equality for our LGBT community. These stories of our community need to be told and retold and deserve the same treatment that history provides to other American heroes. Because history is incomplete, our community continues to need advocates to represent our struggle and to tell our stories. Ladies and gentlemen, you are our advocates. You need to tell our stories. So I wanted to share with you just three stories from my own past about how I was confronted with what I believe to be implicit bias, or at the very least, cultural insensitivity throughout my legal career. In 1995, I know that Michael had said this, 
Most of you were in this room are probably watching the movie Toy Story as kids, which is the most popular movie at that time. But in 1995, I was a second year litigation associate with my first law firm. I was assigned to a toxic tort case involving allegations that a certain chemical pesticide fumigant had contaminated the water aquifer in the Central Valley. I was assigned to take the recipient witness deposition of the retired president of the Dow Chemical Corporation. I prepared my outline, flew all the way to Midland, Michigan, <laughs> arrived early, laid out my documents, and then the other plaintiffs and most of the defense attorneys arrived. I noticed the deposition, so my name was on the pleading and on the subpoena. The former retired president of Dow Corporation walked in along with his attorney. The attorney looked around the room, walked up to one of my co-counsel, tall, good-looking, older Italian guy, but he was Italian and clearly not Latino or Filipino, and he said, Mr. Reyes, are you ready to start? So my co-defense counsel said, I'm not Mr. Reyes, he is, pointing at me. The attorney for the Dow Corporation said, under his breath, oh, I thought you were a paralegal. I said, well, hopefully that's the last time you made that mistake. <laughs> and I proceeded to take the deposition of this client for the next four hours. Um, second story, in 1996, a year after Toy Story, <laughs> I was arguing a motion for good faith settlement determination before an unnamed judge in the Oakland Municipal Court. My client was settling out of a multiple defendant case. And for those of you who are civil practitioners, you know that one of the legal factors that you can consider in a good faith settlement is the tech bill case and whether a settlement was within the ballpark. So I've done my job. I've argued that our settlement, our proposed settlement, was within the ballpark. Before granting my motion for a good faith settlement, the judge, out of left field, so you see the uh, baseball analogy here, <laughs> said to me, are you talking about an American ballpark or a Chinese ballpark? We should be talking about the laws of America, not China. And then he said nothing to the opposing counsel, none of whom, by the way, were Chinese or Filipino or even Asian. So when I told my managing partner about this incident when I was a third year associate, he told me I was being too sensitive, or perhaps I was overreacting, and that I should just develop thick skin like most litigators, and that it was just better to claim victory and walk away. The last story I wanted to tell you is this. I walked into a courtroom where the judge was calling the master jury trial schedule for a criminal case. I sat in the back gallery waiting for the calendar to be called. At the end of the calendar, when all the cases were called, one of the deputy district attorneys came up to me, looked at me and asked, what case are you here for and who is your public defender? So I replied, I'm not here for a case, I'm just here to observe. So what's significant about this last story is that it did not happen back in 1995, or in 2005, or in 2010. This just happened in June of 2017. I had already been appointed to the bench, but was not sworn in yet. I was, for all intents and purposes at that time, a judge of the California Superior Court appointed by our governor. I had visited my colleague, the Honorable Joni Hiramoto's courtroom in Richmond, to introduce myself, and it was assumed that I was someone who was accused of committing a crime. Fortunately for me, Judge Hiramoto recognized me, saw what was happening, and said, counsel and everyone, I want to introduce you to Judge Reyes, who will be joining us on the bench very soon. <laughs> you should have seen the look on the Deputy District Attorney's face. So I'm sure that many of you in this room have been mistaken for a paralegal or a legal secretary 
or for anyone else other than an attorney or a judicial officer. So by a show of hands, let me and your colleagues know if you've ever experienced something similar. That's most of you in this room. So what's important about these instances of implicit bias is that they still occur today. They are dismissed as benign acts. Well, we still have a lot of work to do. Our struggle to overcome implicit bias continues. Our struggle to earn a seat at the corporate boardroom as general counsel continues. Our struggle to earn tenure track as law school professors continues. Our struggle to earn a seat at the equity table of a law firm partnership continues. Our struggle to become a supervising deputy DA or public defender continues. Our struggle to earn a seat on the bench of the judiciary where we rightfully belong continues. It is our differences, our unique cultural characteristics which enrich us as a society. It is important that children and young adults of color, that gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender youth have solid role models to emulate. People like all of our award recipients who fight daily for equality. The Minority Bar Association and the NBC coalitions have come a long way to highlight the accomplishments of our colleagues. So let's stand with each other in unity like we have for the last 40 years. Let's celebrate this evening, but tomorrow let's continue this fight for equality. Let's continue to tell our stories and to educate each other. In closing, I'd like to end this address with a quote from Chief Justice Earl Warren, who wrote this at the time that Brown v. Board of Education was being decided. His words in 1957 are just as applicable today as they were back in 1957, 60 years ago. He wrote, quote, we are now at the point where we must decide whether we are to honor the concept of a plural society which gains strength through diversity, or whether we are to have a bitter fragmentation that will result in perpetual tension and strife. So ladies and gentlemen, let us draw upon the inspiration. Let us draw our inspiration from the beauty of our diversity. Let our diversity transcend all boundaries. Let our diversity break down all walls and make us a stronger society. Good evening, congratulations to all the award recipients, and thank you very much for allowing me to address you tonight. Uh, Union Warders of Pins, 
And all of these individuals were nominated by their bar association or, or organization for their leadership and their commitment to advancing diversity in the legal profession. Their full bios are in your program, so you can read all about their amazing work. I will also ask, if we can, so instead of clapping for each nominee, just kind of do a one clap. Let's practice that, one clap. That way we can all show our love. And then also at the end, we'll give them a full round of applause if they'll be here. So the first award is for the Alameda County Bar Association for Commissioner Tony Mims Cochran. Uh, Commissioner Tony Mims Cochran is unavailable to be here, but she, we thank you for your service. Next, yeah. I'm gonna practice too. Next is the American Constitution Society Bay Area Lawyer Chapter, Pollock Sheck. <laughs> Next we have the American, the Asian American Bar Association of the Greater Bay Area. Hung Chang. We also have the Asian American Criminal Trial Lawyers Association, Casey Lee. Might be not here. Also, we have the Asian Pacific American Bar Association of Silicon Valley, Mark Hunsel. Next, we have the Bar Association of San Francisco Justice and Diversity Center, Richard Zitchin. We have the Bay Area Lawyers for Individual Freedom, Bela, Jennifer Orfman. We have the Black Women Lawyers of Northern California, Megan Lawson. Now up to stage, California Association of Black Lawyers, Sinead Buffington. <laughs> Next we have the Charles Houston Bar Association, Deborah Moss West. We have the Chinese American Lawyers of the Bay Area, Carol Leung. <laughs> Consumer Attorneys of California Diversity Committee, Micah Star Liberty. <laughs> the East Bay Lorasa Lawyers Association, Araceli Martinez Orguin. Filipino Bar Association of Northern California, Christine Mari Palma Stark. <laughs> the Iranian American Bar Association, Elika Vafabi. <laughs> Jewish Bar Association of San Francisco, Cody Harris. <laughs> Korean American Bar Association, Northern California, Matthew Ahn. <laughs> Marin County Bar Association, A. Jean Grove. <laughs> Marin County Women's Lawyers, Lois Prentice. Queen's Bench Bar Association, the Honorable Barbara O'Hare. The South Asian Bar Association of Northern California, Madhuri Namali. The 
Vietnamese American Bar Association in Northern California, Diane Little. And finally, the Women's Lawyers of Alameda County, Barbara Dickinson. Yes, please give another round of applause. Huge round of applause for this.